morning. Thanks for tuning in. We're uh, going to do a bit of a brood inspection and Q&A on this hive, blowing a bit of smoke in the entrance to calm them down. Now, I know that this is a nice gentle hive, so I'm okay here by the entrance, but if you're new to beekeeping and you don't know how your hive behaves, then make sure you protect yourself first with a good bee suit. So I'm just going to do that now, zip this up. If you've got questions, put them in the comments and we'll get to answering those making sure both, first of all, that the middle zip is done all the way to the top. And then you've got the two side zips to just zip your hood on. And then a Velcro to go over the top to make sure bees aren't getting in where the zips join. Okay, so this hive here, you may remember a couple of weeks back, we scraped some uh, wax off the top of the brood frames and we just put it into a little area here. Now the bees are just uh, in the way of the vision but they did a really nice job of spreading out that wax. You can see the little yellow joins in there. So they got rid of the wax that we had just lumped carelessly on the surface of the comb, reshaped it into to help form the hexagon patterns and join all the parts of the flow frames together. So there's a nice little show and tell of how bees actually recycle wax inside the hive. And the reason why we did that was because we often get asked, how can you speed up the process of the bees storing honey in the flow frames? So that's one way. It doesn't really change anything until you get a good nectar flow. Now we don't have a good nectar flow here yet. And it's partly what I'm gonna get inside the hive today to have a look at is whether there's any nectar at all in any of the frames or whether the bees are really hungry. So let's pop off the top box and have a look at the frames inside. Meanwhile, if you think of questions you've got, flow hive beekeeping, beekeeping in general, put it in the comments below and we'll get to answering those. Also let us know whereabouts in the world you are tuning in from. Super interesting to us. It's an amazing uh, global audience. Okay. Next, I'll pop the roof off, let's put that aside. And the inner cover with the J tool, just going to leave that off because the bees will actually propolize it up. But at the moment they haven't. Now because I'm going to pop the whole lot off, I could have left this cover on. The queen won't be on the underside because we've got an excluder in place down here. Nevertheless, those bees there, I might as well lean that up against the hive so they can just casually walk back in. The next thing we're going to do is take off this top box and we're going to upend it and put it down over here. And the reason why we're upending it like that is so that we don't squash any bees on the underside. So to do that, I'm just going to lever it off. There's a lift point here at the back Often people ask, where are the lift points? The lift points are where the windows are. A really nice, generous lift point there. And there's a handle at the other end. It's light because there isn't any honey in it yet. So it's simply going to put that up there like that. And then we're in to the brood box. The excluder peels off. Now the queen could be on the underside. So just have a quick look before you shake those bees away. Okay, can't see her there. So we can put that one aside, again leaning it up in case the queen is actually on there. And then we're into the brood nest. So if you've got questions, put them in the comments. It's all about just helping answer questions and drop those uh, barriers that might be preventing you from really getting in and enjoying your beekeeping. Okay, so here what I'm doing at the moment is just generally having a look at the health of the hive because I can see there's quite a lot of bees. There's not a huge amount yet. They're not completely covered. When there's a lot of bees, you can't see the frames when you open it like this, but there's a nice generous amount between them. So already it looks quite healthy. Look at that. It's a beautiful thing. And as I uh, pull a, a frame out, what I'm first looking for is one that's going to come up easily that doesn't have a whole lot of burr comb connecting to another frame because it's the first frame has to go straight up whereas the next ones can go sideways first which helps 
you can go a little bit sideways just to break the propolis between the end bars. J tool under the end like that. And as you've loosened up the other end, away you go. So I'm just pulling that frame straight up, nice and gentle. You don't want to roll any bees. You could use a bit of smoke between the frame to clear the bees out. Now I'm just having a look at what we've got going on here. And what I'm seeing is an amazing amount of brood. Look at that. So this is all the capped brood here, where you see the capping is a bit more brown in colour and it's, it's uh, not, it doesn't have that translucent uh, look that, that honeycomb has when they put their wax capping on top. And straight away I'm also seeing that they're a bit hungry because there's no stored honey around the top like there usually is. So if you look in this area here, what I'm also seeing which is really good and what I was hoping to see is nectar glistening in some of the cells. So they are bringing something in. If you look closely in this area, give us a thumbs up if you can see a little shine of nectar down some of these cells here. I'm just clearing them away. There we go. You should be able to see a little glint there. And that's good news. So the bees are finding some flowers, which means they won't starve. But they are pretty hungry looking at this hive and they've got lots of mouths to feed here with all of the young larvae down the cells. Have we got any questions coming in? Yes, Cedar. Um, there's a question coming in from Javi who's actually in Chile. But Javi, um, you might need to reframe your question. He's asking if there's honey in the super, can we still put that in without squeezing the bees? So I'm yep. not sure whether, Cedar, you understand that one. Maybe Javi just needs to add a bit more info onto that one. Okay, I think what he's concerned about is when you harvest the top box where the bees get squeezed. Ah, now, yes. Now, we put a lot of effort into that over, over a decade of inventing with my father. And we've actually got a whole patent about it. And basically, um, if we had to put the moving parts bang together like that, then it would move up and down. Now, as it moved down, what could happen then is legs or wings could be in that gap and get caught. So what we did is we actually made the moving parts like this. So there's a V here that the bees join with wax. So when it moves up and down, there's a gap here now. And the wax uh, just either just has a little flap of wax or sometimes it dislodges. But what you have is then moving parts that aren't touching each other. And, and it's really important to us that it's as gentle as possible and I think we have succeeded in doing that where you can harvest honey from just behind your hive with the bees hardly even noticing that you are harvesting some honey from their hive. So that was the goal and I'm really happy to say we um, achieved that and it is a, a, a very gentle way to harvest honey. Taking out the next frame, any questions put them in the, the comments. What have we got here? We've got a whole lot of pollen. So that's cool because we do need pollen stores as well. Now what I'm gonna do is flick this frame around and put it down here so you can get a really good look at that pollen in the frame. There we go. So you've got all different colors there. So pollen is their protein source and they don't just eat it uh, neat, what they do is they ferment it like a good sourdough. They get the pollen once they've scraped it off all their hairs and they push it into the cells with their heads and they top it with a little bit of honey to let it ferment and they make a nice little sourdough. And that's, uh, that's what's called bee bread and that's what they use as their protein source. So um, really good to see all the different colours of pollen here. Did you get a good visual on that? Let us know if you can see it. Uh, maybe if I tilt it up like that, <laughs> and not like that. Okay, if I tilt it up like this and clear some bees away from this area, what you've got is all of these different colours of pollen down the cells, oranges, yellows, and so on, so, and whites. Good to see. So that's as important as nectar to have in your hive. So although we're low on nectar, we do have good pollen stores. Any questions? You see that, does the pollen relate to the flowers? Like why are there different colours? Exactly, so 
each flower has a, a different uh, pollen and in fact you can look under electron microscopes at honey and see the types of pollen grains and identify what flowers they came from because each pollen grain is unique and one of the things that's unique about it is its colour so although you get similar tones you'll get all different pollens here so this isn't some flowers only produce nectar and some only produce pollen but the idea is they're attracting bees in order to to get the service of pollination done and it's a little bit of a win-win there for the flowers and the bees they get the nectar and protein from the pollen and the flowers get the pollination so these ones aren't very pollen specific but if you've ever looked at a flower that sometimes you touch it and you get all of these yellow pollen grains what happens is the bees will fly towards the flower and they have a static charge and as they get close you'll even find pollen grains leaping off the flower onto their bodies and then what they'll do is they'll, they'll forage around and collect pollen all over their body and then they will start uh, grooming it down all their hairs. Bees even have hair on their eyeballs, it's wild. And they push it all down to their, their hind legs in what we call the pollen baskets. They fly back to the hive with sometimes almost their body weight in nectar and pollen. And back in the hive, then they will actually dislodge it from their hind legs, push it into the cells with their heads and away they go, making their bee bread. So all the different colours simply come from the different pollens in different flowers. That's amazing, Said I've seen um, a magnolia we've got and they, the, the pollen all ends up in there and it's like they're having a little you know, spa bath in the magnolia with all the pollen. It's so yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> And sometimes, occasionally, you see drones doing it too, but it's pretty rare. My sister, she's a bit of a bee spy, and she's got some great footage of drones all coloured in pollen for some unknown reason, because apparently they don't do any of that kind of work. <laughs> yeah. Oh, great. Cedar Marcello's, um, no, Selva, sorry, has tuned in from Toot Garouk in Victoria, which I think is where our, one of our ambassadors is based. Um, just installed a first colony into the flow hive. Do you ever, ever need to remove the brood frames and clear them of their comb? So, yes, it's called cycling out. So it is a good idea to cycle out some frames when they get old and dark. These are all quite fresh because we shook a swarm into this box and only put empty frames in. So everything you see here was drawn this season by the bees and they did a wonderful job of just drawing it nice and straight on the combs, which is good to see. But when it gets old and dark, it's been used for multiple seasons, good idea to move combs, you see, like that, towards the edge of the hive. Now, once you've got it on the edge, typically they'll just store honey in it instead of brood, and that's an opportune moment. If you've got uh, foundationless frames, you can simply just shake the bees off, cut the comb out, and put it back in. Where you'd put it back in is closer towards the center, and the cycle goes on. If you've got uh, wax and wire, then you'll actually need to find a replacement, take that one away, take it back to the shed, go through some processing in order to get it ready to put back into the hive. And the same with um, plastic foundation, you'll have to go through a process. So one of the benefits of naturally drawn comb or foundationless frames is you simply can just cut out the wax anytime you like and put it straight back in and therefore cycling out some of the old comb. Okay, pick up this one again. We're seeing a lot of brood. We've got a bit of bit of nectar coming in, which is fantastic to see. Uh, it's exactly what I wanted to see today. They were very hungry a couple of weeks ago when we looked in here, and they're starting to bring in some and store it again around the top of the brood pattern here. So if I'm just scraping that away, give us a thumbs up if you can see that nectar glistening. It's a wonderful sight. Look at that beautiful honey they're creating from that nectar. When it's ready, they'll cap it off and save it for when they need it. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, what's interesting and what you're seeing here is really different sizes of cells. So the ones they're storing nectar in over here are a lot bigger. They're closer to a six millimeter cell size. See that? And if you just slide the camera across the comb this way, where they are using it for brood, they're a lot smaller a 5.3 millimeter size cell or thereabouts. So bees will store honey in larger size cells if they can. They often make cells that are universal, which they'll store honey or brood in, 
but as soon as they're away from where they want to be doing brood, which is often around the edges or in the top box, they usually go larger because it's just simply more efficient to store honey in. And that's why we made the flow frames a larger size cell than the 5.3 millimeter uh, brood cells, which is what bee, uh, beekeepers are conventionally used to when they put foundation sheets in. So someone could make foundation sheets that were a larger size and that would store more honey, but uh, beekeepers tend to just use them one in the same, use the same size cells throughout the hive in a conventional way. Whereas we've gone and purposefully made them a bit bigger so they're more likely to store honey even when you don't use an excluder. Great. Cedar Marcello's are tuning in from Melbourne and Ringwood. Just inspected the hive now, Marcello has two brood boxes, um, but the queen seems to be laying more on the top brood box than the bottom brood box. At the moment there are four full frames of capped honey in the same brood box. So the question is wondering if the bees will move that honey up to the flow frames and any idea why the queen is predominantly laying on the top brood box. So you've got the two brood boxes going on the hive. Okay, so the normal structure, when I say normal, bees will be bees and there is no perfect normal, but there's what most often happens. So most often you'll get the brood in the middle of the hive, honey towards the edges, and the honey stored on top. But in this case, it sounds like your queen, for whatever reason, is deciding to lay up here, which happens to be quite central in your hive because I assume you got the flow super on top of that. So what you'll find probably is as they get going, they'll also uh, be doing more and more brood in the center of the bottom box as well. But that's just normal for bees. They, they will um, always ignore the rule books, no matter how many books we write about them and, and uh, do what they do. So it's totally fine for them to be doing their brood mainly in the top box. I tend to just like one brood box. It's a lot simpler to do your brood inspection. You know the queen's in here somewhere instead of having to look through two whole boxes to find her sometimes. But in the colder regions, often people like to run slightly bigger hives so they've got more stores for the winter. Because as you've said, there's a lot of honey stored in your brood boxes as well. Did that answer everything in that question? Yeah, that, that was good. Basically, you did see. Good. <laughs> um, look, Samuel's just pointed out, and, and we are aware of the Samuel, that there's a Chinese company who's selling auto flow hives on eBay. Um, obviously, they're, they're they're not our flow frames. And just wondering, are our flow frames patented? Absolutely. We, we patented since 2013, well before we launched, and we've got multiple patents as well. And I guess it's a bit sad to see the, uh, the, the rip-offs out there. There's people that will take people's money, not even ship them anything. There's people that make bad copies of, of our product and so on. So that's just a part of the world and it's a bit sad, but do look out for that. Make sure you, you're, you aren't getting ripped off and that you have the real product. And if you want to be sure, look up honeyflow.com. Now you will be referred to the .com.au, um, but it must say honeyflow is the domain name. So that is the important bit to, to look up and make sure you're, you are buying the real thing. Um, yes, there's a lot of bad copies and uh, a lot of um, scams going on out there continuously and we actually put quite a lot of effort trying to clean up that space and shut down a lot of the scam sites and, and so on. So um, yes, if you do see any, any scams out there, just let us know and help report it. Yeah, great. Thanks, Cedar. Um, another question coming in from Javi, just wondering, the soup is starting to fill up with honey, how long would it take to fill a, f I know this is a tricky one, a full flow frame in the super of honey? So, the answer like many things in beekeeping is it depends. Now if you've got a pumping hive, heaps of bees and a good nectar flow, you can fill a super in a week. Now that's extreme. Uh, and We have heard stories of, of 
two days or even a day, which is very hard to believe, but a week is fast around here. We do get it sometimes in the springtime. You'll harvest all the frames. Next week, they're totally full again. But that only happens when you've got a pumping hive, lots of bees, a strong colony, and that really uh, coincides with nectar dripping to the ground off the flowers. Conversely, you can get situations where you won't get honey in a whole season because there's only just enough to keep the bees going and there's not enough nectar for them to store some for you as well. So it's important to be watching and learning and making sure you, you leave honey for the bees. And the flow frames allow you just to harvest a little bit, just one frame if you want to and leave the rest for the bees or you could harvest even part of a frame and leave the rest for the bees. So that's versatile if you're unsure which is a nice way to do it. As a conventional beekeeper, I used to just process in batches where I'd take all the supers off and I'd process the whole lot together because that's the way you got a bit of efficiency. Now, um, it's actually less disruption for the bees just to take a frame or two at a time and leave the rest for them. So uh, that's, that's just a, a nice, nice way to do it. But getting back to your question, on the extreme, a a week to fill a box or on the other extreme might not fill it up in the season but more likely just two three four months before they fill up your flow hive super so uh, sometimes you need to benchmark your hive let's say you might have a, a slow hive that's not really getting any but the one beside it's really pulling in the nectar and then you might have to investigate why that is maybe there's a problem in the hive so each hive is different as well. Great. Funny you should mention that, Cedar. I actually had a guy called yesterday from Queensland and he thought there was something wrong with his hive because he'd harvested honey and within about three or four weeks it was full again of honey. And he actually he said, is this really wrong? Is, it, is there something wrong? And I said, no, no, that's awesome. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I've got a problem. I've got a problem. I'm getting too much honey. So he was just could not believe that that had happened like in such a short amount of time. So these uh, bees are super healthy, which I'm happy about. I'll start putting them back together soon, but if you've got questions, keep, uh, keep them coming in. So can you add, um, if you've got a brew box out of one timber, obviously we have the Aracaria and the Western Red Cedar, can you use different types of timbers with the hives, like swap the boxes over? Absolutely, the bees won't mind. They're, uh, anything wooden is lovely. They'll even make um, homes in synthetic substrates like there's styrofoam hives and plastic hives you can get. But wood, I think, is their favourite because it mimics what they've evolved with. Tree hollows and logs and things that uh, the bees have, have evolved in nesting in. And what you're doing is you're creating a, a, a tree-like hollow here by stacking your boxes up. Oh, thanks, see, we've just got a bit of building going on, but hopefully with me coughing in the building, you all still can hear everything. Um, Vic's tuned in from not quite sure where, wondering, can you make a nuke using two different hives? And if so, will the bees fight even if they don't have a queen? Okay, that's, uh, that's a good question and it's a debated topic. Sometimes you'll see really experienced beekeepers just mixing up frames from one hive and another and the bees don't seem to really care. Other times you'll get, when you're mixing up bees from, from a couple of hives, you'll get some fighting going on. They usually sort it out. But um, one method to merge two colonies, if you like, without fighting is to stack boxes and put one colony in one and the other in the other box and put a sheet of newspaper or two between, poke some little holes in it to make sure there's airflow and the bees will slowly chew away that newspaper and do a slow merge and by then they're used to each other's pheromones. Having said that, um, it's quite common for beekeepers to uh, actually take some frames out of multiple hives. Let, let's say they're doing their spring management and they don't want to take even splits, they just want to take a couple of frames out of each hive or one frame out of each hive and they'll put them together in another box and the bees seem to work it out okay and away they go and uh, raise a queen if there's a queen cell on there already or some eggs they can do that from 
and then what you have is a hive that, as you say, is a merge of a few different hives. That can work nicely as well. Oh, great. I'd love to see that newspaper way, Seeds. We might have to do it one day because you mentioned that a little bit, putting the newspaper between the hives. Okay, yeah, we'll do that one day. Good idea. <laughs> uh, Chuck Rouse joined in this morning. Um, he's our ambassador saying, wishing he was here. It's freezing. It's very, very cold where he is and we're in a complete heat wave here, Chuck. So, so we feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> it's very, very hot here. We'll complain about how hot it is. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Here's that frame we've seen a few times with the comb guard, which is a piece of wood you put up the top. Oh. It has fallen out. The bees have, haven't really minded too much. They've just built around it. So that's pretty neat to see. A lot of brood. This hive's just about to explode with bee numbers. It does explain why there's not much honey around the edges too, because to feed the young larvae, they use about a, a frame of honey and a frame of pollen to raise a frame of brood. So you can see why with this amount of brood in so many frames that they are a bit starved of honey as well. They're simply in a build-up phase. But glad to see a bit of nectar coming in to keep them going. A little queen cell here too, or a queen cup this is. Looks like it's just there, a, a just-in-case cell. It's just a dry little cup in case they need to supersede the queen. If they did turn it into a queen cell, it would get three times as long, like a bit of a peanut hanging down with a a uh, queen in there that they feed royal jelly for its entire gestation in order to turn it into a queen instead of a worker bee. Okay, it's a beautiful thing. So having spotted that queen cup, is this hive likely to swarm? Not this time of year. Here we are in our uh, late summer and it's unlikely that bees will swarm this time of year. You sometimes get some late swarms but You've got plenty of room in the hive still. They haven't even filled the top box yet, so very unlikely to swarm. So, but what they might do is raise a queen just in case. The queen will, will, will make a piping noise in response to the, the queen that's laying in here, and she'll go and sting it, and it won't actually emerge into the hive. So um, they'll often do that just in case, but, uh, it's not really a problem, you can just let the bees make those decisions for themselves. Oh, great. So, the um, question coming, you were saying about the bees won't swarm. If your super was really full, um, would it be a good time to split your hive now, or would you just leave it if you were in, um, in our area, in northern New South Wales? So, here in this subtropical region close to the coast, you could actually split your hive almost any time of year. The time to split it is when you open the side windows and you can hardly see the comb because there's so many bees in there. And that's, that's a good time to take a split from the hive and relieve that congestion and relieve the, uh, the primary, trigger, uh, primary trigger of swarming, which is too much congestion in the hive, not enough space for the queen to lay eggs. Uh, other, other areas where you've got a typical season with snowy winters and things, you'd only do your splits in the springtime and early summer, usually. Do you always need to use a smoker when you do a hive inspection? The answer is no, but pretty much we always do, uh, just in case. It's also a useful tool, because let's say we're pulling out this frame, we didn't want to squash any bees, we can just add a little bit of smoke, and you can see those bees clearing away. So that's a very useful function. And while it might not be nice to have smoke blown in your face as a bee, it's also not nice to be squashed. So it's um, a nice way to just clear bees out of the way where you need to work and also it has a calming effect on the bees. So I would say yes, use your smoker all the time until you get very experienced and let's say you've got a really gentle colony and when it's small is often the time to do that. You can do inspections without the smoker but please use your smoker and a good bee suit uh, for your first years of beekeeping until you're really comfortable to make those decisions. And Cedar, is there any hive that you particularly recommend for beginners? So our flow hive is very popular for beginners. I think half of our audience is brand new to beekeeping. And so the, the flow hive is a, is a great choice because you don't need to learn about 
uncapping, you don't need to buy an extractor, you don't need to dedicate half your, your, your shed or your laundry into an, an extracting room and make all of that mess and so on. It's very much as you can have a hive and get real produce from something just this big in your garden. And we have a few models and it's a little bit based on price in a way. So that all our models work, but you, you, you start with the hybrid, then you move your way up to the, the largest size hive with the most um, flow frames in it and the more uh, premium wood being the cedar. And also we've got bells and whistles here. So it's a little bit, um, if you if you can afford it, go for the bells and whistles because they just make things a little bit easier. But we also want to keep options available for those that are on a bit more of a budget with their beekeeping. So any of them are suitable for beginners is the answer. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Samuel um, is tuned in from the UK um, and just wondering, um, coming up to the beekeeping season there, and how long do you think it would take for the bees to start filling up their brood box with comb? Okay, so say it again, whereabouts? So it's in the UK. It's in the UK, And yep. it's, it's, it's coming up for beekeeping season here, he's saying. Um, and just wondering how long you think it would take for the bees to basically fill up that brood box. Okay, coming up for beekeeping season. That's a surprise. That's a, uh, yeah, I see, coming up in a while. Yeah, it, yep. There's a little while. No, 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 it's, you're, it? quite, you're quite right. It's hard when you've got two seasons running in your head. <laughs> <laughs> and bees are buzzing around your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you put your nuke in and the, the, uh, they can move quite quickly. So um, a, a nucleus is the easiest way to get started because it's a going little starter hive. You transfer that in transfer that into your brood box but there isn't really a time constraint on that because it's a going little hive as, as it is and it'll be okay for a while just sitting there as a little nu nuke starter hive and when you've got nice weather and when you have some time put it into your bottom box and the time that they take to fill which I think is your question will really depend on how virile and, and strong your genetics are and on the nectar flow. If those two things coincide, then in, uh, in a few weeks, three weeks or a month, they might have filled up the whole box with comb. And when they get to this point like this, where all of the frames are drawn, there's a lot of bees in here, then go ahead and put your honey super on. So fantastic, great to hear you getting started there in the UK. Yeah, fantastic. Um, Matthew Donald, I don't know, maybe he's a friend of your seed, he's saying, are you coming back to Newcastle anytime soon? <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, I'm not due down in Newcastle, but um, I'll, uh, I'll sing out when I'm heading that way. It's a, it's a beautiful area, nice for a bit of paragliding too, which I do enjoy. So Chuck's asking um, about the AFB vaccine and wondering what you think about that. Okay, I think it's fantastic that there is people working on solutions for AFB, which does plague some areas of the world quite a lot. And uh, there's a lot of antibiotics that get used um, against AFB, not here in Australia, we're not allowed to use it, but in, in some countries. And um, I just think it's great that people are working on solutions. Hopefully one day we can not have so much of that disease plaguing people. Um, question coming and said on the hive that you're working on now, wondering what finish has been put on that cedar box. Okay, this is a, a deck coat. So the outdoor decking products are the ones that last the longest on wood. That's what we've found over years of trying different things. So if you want to keep it looking like wood, then outdoor decking uh, products, they're made to keep it looking like wood for as long as possible. They often have a little bit of a tint in it and that stops some of the UV graying the wood. So that's just something to be aware of. If you're using a, um, a deck coat, it will tint the wood a little bit. And, and that'll last for, for quite a long time. Otherwise you can use a house paint and you can have a lot of fun with your art on the hive as well. So this is a, a good quality outdoor house paint paint that on the outside that'll last for many years and especially if you've chosen our Arakaria wood we really recommend 
putting just a coat of paint on the outside. Whereas if you've got the cedar, you can go ahead and use coats that keep it looking like wood, like these decking products. Great. And so the, noticing too that we always tend to paint our roofs, is there any reason for that? Yes, the roof does really cop a lot of weather, so that is a, a good one to paint and try and get a lot of paint in all the joins as well and that'll give you the best weather seal. Uh, give it a good paint all over and even on the inside if you can, so you can paint the shingles before you put them down. If you have a look under here, I've painted the inside and that just limits your expansion and contraction and warping of the, the roof surfaces. So so it's a nice way to go is to paint the shingles first and then add a bit more paint as you join the ridge cap on to make sure you're getting a seal in there. And that'll give you a good lasting roof as well. So okay. do you need to register your beehive? Absolutely, you do need to register your beehive and well, it depends which country you're in, but here in Australia, the answer is yes. So you register them with the DPI. We send you reminder emails about that after, after your purchase. There's a small little contribution to make to the DPI, which, which goes towards free services, like uh, uh, you can send away for testing if you think you might have AFB or EFB in your hive and things like that, and helping our, our country stay pest and disease free. <laughs> well lessen those in our country. So um, it's a great thing. There's also education that comes through when you register your hives. And it's also really important, um, especially uh, the importance has been shown with the varroa outbreak and trying to control that. We really need to know where all the hives are in order to control the uh, varroa. So yes, always register. If you haven't done it already and you've just recently purchased, jump on the DPI, register your hives. Um, we'll put a link in the comments, it's actually called different things in different states, but we'll send you a reminder email about that, so look out for that email. And you put a, a number on your hive as well, that way if your hive gets stolen, that does happen but it's pretty unusual, then you can identify which, um, where that hive came from and so on. Right, um, Tizza who tunes in every week, wondering what possible reason would an entire hive up and leave? Okay, that's called absconding and it's pretty unusual. Now, um, genetics could play a role in that, where a hive is just a, a bit flighty. But another reason is a hive beetle outbreak that's bad enough that the bees are like, this has turned into a slime nest instead of a good beehive, so we're out of here. So hive beetles can cause an abscond if they, if they get a bit of a foothold and start laying all throughout the combs and there's all maggots in their brood combs. That can cause an abscond. Um, but otherwise, genetics plays the role, really. So can you get honeycomb out of a flow hive? Absolutely. So we've shown you uh, uh, if you have a look up on our on our live streams, you'll sh we'll have some examples of getting honeycomb out of the hive. Often it's just honey right on the edges. Let's just have a look here. I suspect that this one might be wall-to-wall -wall brood because they're really trying to gear up at the moment. But let's just see if we've got honey on the edge here. I might just add a little bit of smoke, although if you are getting honeycomb out, you don't want a smoky flavour, so you've got to be careful how much smoke you give them. What I'm gonna do is just pop this frame out and if it was full of honey, then we could simply cut some of that out and take it away and it'd be a beautiful way to enjoy some honeycomb. So as predicted, that one doesn't have any brood in it that I can see right now. There was a little patch here that's been used by brood at some point because I can tell by the color has changed in that area. The bees, silk cocoons and the footprints and things will make comb darker. So that area was useful either because this hive's hungry, but if it was fully capped, if it was fully uh, capped with honey, 
by all means you could take that whole frame away and enjoy that if you had a nice party to go to or, or as you've seen us do shake the, all the bees off and just cut a nice heart or something out of the center of the comb and take that away for your cheese platter and put the rest back for the bees and they'll fill in that shape quite quickly with the comb again. You can also collect honeycomb in the roof of the flow hive by leaving the cap out and the bees will get up there and actually store honey in that roof, ca uh, roof cavity. You can put a Tupperware container or something over the top of that hole to limit the area you want them to store in also. So a couple of options there if you do want to get some honeycomb from your hive. Cedar, can you add a um, flow hive super onto a 10 frame Langstroth box and if so, what size would they need? Absolutely, so the two sizes we've made our flow supers are two regular sizes. So this size here is the smaller size which fits the 8 frame Langstroth and this size here is the size that fits the 10 frame Langstroth. So it's a bit confusing because flow frames are wider for more honey storage. This one has seven frames across, so that's the one, the flow, this, the flow super seven suits a 10 frame typical Langstroth hive. And the flow frame six will suit the eight frame typical Langstroth size. Now there will be slight size variations, so it's not necessarily a perfect match, but it should be within a few millimeters. Great. Cedar, and, and um, also can you modify your own box and then just put the flow frames in your existing Langstroth box? Yes, you can. So by all means do that. We've got somewhere right in the beginning, we were showing you how to cut your box out to put your flow frames in a conventional hive. Uh, Stu and I, as we were inventing it, we thought that people would mostly just buy the frames and cut their own boxes, but it became very apparent very quickly that people just wanted it all done for them. But somewhere there, you'll, you'll see a guide to modifying a Langstroth box to suit flow frames. Yeah, I think it's actually on, if you click onto the flow frame page, I think the link's there or under the manuals and assembly guides as well. I think you'll find it and it's great. It's um, a lot of people call up and want it and it tells you exactly how to cut out your box um, if you wanted to go down that path. Okay, great. Right. Seeds is just topping up his smoker. Top up the smoker a little bit and get it going again. And we might start putting this hive back together. Thanks a lot for all your great questions. We've got time for a couple more as we wrap up this hive. Um, a late person's just tuning in, Seeds, so just wondering, have, did you spot the queen in this hive? I didn't. I didn't even go through with an effort to spot the queen. Often we do, just by chance but I didn't spot the queen, but I'm not too worried about this hive. It's doing really well. There's a lot of brood, so there's no need to actually visibly spot the queen this time. And it uh, can take a bit of effort sometimes to go through all the frames and actually find her. Okay. For beginner beekeepers, Cedar, what would you rec how would you recommend they get started? The best way to get started is to grab one of our starter bundle, which includes a bee suit, smoker, a hive tool uh, and all the things you need apart from the bees to get going with your hive and once you've done that I would really recommend but you don't have to, it depends on which way you learn that you take a look at thebeekeeper.org and at least get some of the beginner lessons off there. This, it's a, it is a fundraiser and the, the start of it's free but if you really like it, you can keep going with that program. It's a great fundraiser. We've planted a million trees. I'm very proud of that um, website. A lot, of, uh, a lot of experts from all around the world contributing to that also, very high quality training material. So things you need is your equipment and then the, the knowledge and then you need to get the bees locally. But starting by grabbing a starter bundle is a great way to go because then you're away. As you assemble your box, you can start learning about bees and uh, also putting an order in to get a nucleus to put in your hive once you're ready. So it's when you open up your rear access cover and you, there's only little bits of honey there, do you need to open up your hive to see if it's full of honey to extract or can you just extract if there's little bits in that end frame? 
So if you're seeing um, a little bit of honey in the end frame view, then usually there's, there's quite a lot of honey on the inside too. Now if you're getting a bit impatient, you can just open just part of a frame and taste that honey, but it's best to wait till you're really seeing uh, capped cells in the rear window here, which you won't see here today. You can see they were capped cells, there's only a couple left, but they got hungry and started to eat them away. So capped cells like that with the coloured honey going all the way out to the end is what you want to see when you're harvesting. However, as said, if you just want a bit of a taste, you can harvest a bit early by just putting your key in a little ways and turning it in one of the frames and that won't bother the bees too much to, to harvest part of one frame. And so it's how long has Flow Hive been going for? Well, we're coming up here to year eight, would you believe it? So, wow. so um, we launched in 2015 and it really uh, took the world by storm. It was an incredible way that the, the world loved our product and I don't know if you know the story but um, we started off with crowdfunding and we got $12 million worth of orders in the first eight weeks and that was our flying start from myself and my dad in a shed inventing the, the hive to actually uh, getting it all around the world and building that community of beekeepers all around the world. And uh, we managed to do that. We managed to, to get all, all the hives out. And here we are now eight years in, still going, still answering questions and still enjoying beekeeping. So thanks a lot for being a part of that journey and a part of helping build the community. I know a lot of you shared that story around in the beginning and really helped us um, get going and get our flow hive to the world. Fantastic seeds. Is, um, now the two frames that you've pulled out, will you put them back in exactly the same way? I will try, <laughs> um, but I do remember that second frame and I took a mental note that I flicked it around, um, so I'll spin that back. But these frames are pretty straight, so it won't matter too much. It's when you've got comb touching comb that you've got a problem. So just keep a look out for that. It's the main thing. So I needed to put that back like this, I believe. A lot of bees here. And in like that. And as I go down, I'm just making sure that the comb isn't actually touching the comb on the other side between them. If it does squash together, the bees can't service that area and the hive beetles can take that opportune moment to lay a lot of eggs in that zone. Adding a little bit of smoke down between the end bars so that I can then push them together without squashing any bees. And then we can fit that last frame in between. Thank you bees, they've been very patient today with um, me standing around yapping. But they are a nice calm colony to work with, which is good. One like this, you can sometimes get away without the suit, but only do that once you're very experienced. There we go, last frame in. Now it's important to still pull the frames together to keep the bee space right, otherwise you might get some comb that gets built between the frames. All turns into a bit of a mess and hard to inspect next time. So here we are, just adding a bit of smoke to clear the bees away again. And just pushing the frames together. Keep the excess space on the edges of your hive like that. And the frames all tightly together. That way you've got the comb correctly spaced for how the bees like it. Much less likely to cre create the burr comb between them. Next we're going to smoke the bees off from around the edge and just add our excluder back on top. Here it is. Give it a little bit of a wiggle to get any bees off. And now before bees start climbing all over it, it's a good time to just pop the super right back on. There we go. And we've now got our super back on, hopefully there'll be a nectar flow. This colony is getting nice and strong. As soon as there's a good nectar flow, they'll really start filling this frame. And I can tell that because they're already starting to do all of the little wax joins you can see here on the flow frame parts. You can even see it in the end frame view already. 
the little pieces of wax they're using to join the hive parts together. Thanks a lot for tuning in. Do let us know what you uh, would like us to cover. We're always open to ideas. We're here to help answer your questions. And best of luck if you're starting your beekeeping season soon in the Northern Hemisphere. Get yourself prepared. Get your starter kits. It's a good time. Get your boxes together. And um, the UK, there's been, uh, been some great beekeeping in the UK. Jamie Oliver's been doing uh, wonderful uh, beekeeping and great stories over there. So it's good to see people getting inspired about beekeeping in the UK. And uh, also Northern Hemisphere, there's um, yeah, a great uh, beekeeping season to come over the uh, next few months as spring uh, starts and people get into getting their hives together and their bees in their boxes and the flowers start blooming. So it's an exciting time for you over there. Thank you for tuning in and same time next week we'll have something interesting to show you.